Great, great to be with you this morning. If we haven't met before, my name's Phil. I'm uh, one of the leaders here. I, I'm an English teacher normally. I'm married to Lizzie, uh, sitting over there. And we've got a little girl called Maisie. And uh, yeah, we've been around for a long time. It's great that you could be with us. Um, I, do you know, I think the Christian life, it's, it's, it's one of these things which if you... I guess if you really grasp, um, or even if you're just starting to grasp what it's all about, you kind of never really get over the, the, the kind of wonder of it. And I think um, when I got saved, I really just couldn't really get over the fact that Jesus died for me and that um, you know all my mess, all my sin, and all my shame, all my mess... Um, died with him on the cross and that uh, you know I was now gloriously free uh, of all that to live my life in a completely new way for a completely different end um, and and then you know a good few years later I discovered this that that God actually was was my dad was my father um, which is something that I don't think I'll ever really get over the fact that he, you know, he's not the great boss or the great headmaster in the sky, but actually he's a really loving, generous, good dad. And my goodness, how many people need to hear that in this world, just in this city, that that is who God is. That is not commonly known in my experience. Um, And I feel like I'll never get over that, but I'll tell you what I'm... I'm struggling to get over right now. This is the main thing that I'm struggling to get over right now. It's that God himself is a community. And that actually one of the wonders of salvation is that we get caught up in that community. And we become part of this eternally existing, glorious, triune God. Uh, Lots of big words. Uh, but what it means is we get in, we get right in close into that intimate place. That's what Jesus said when he said, you know, I'm going to create a place for you before the Father. And where I am, I'll draw you to myself. You know, that, that's often spoken about in, in, in at funerals, and I, I understand why. But actually what that, these verses are really about in John's gospel is the fact that we get a place now, here and now, through the Spirit, we get a place to stand just as we are before the Father. Isn't that amazing? I, I'm, I'm struggling to come to terms with that just now, which I think is a good place, a good place to be. And the reason I mention that is because what I want to talk about this morning is this idea of community. Um, and the amazing thing about community um, is that, it, well, for us, let me just give you a bit, bit of backstory. Um, We have, myself and Lizzie, have led a small group in this church for about four years. Um, And that really is one of the great privileges um, of my life to do that. Um, And I'll tell you why. Because through that, I have made some of the most amazing friends that you could possibly want in your life. At the start of the summer, after a long walk um, of faith, really, um, when Lizzie and I were trying to uh, buy our first house um, together, uh, we and you know a, a walk where our small group had gone with us and prayed for us, and you know the night we put in an offer and they said, "Oh, we need a night to sleep on it." They were all standing with us in our front room of our rented flat and, and praying with us that we would um, have this new house. And then we got it, and there was a big celebration. And then having got it, basically these people, and actually many others who are not in our small group but across this church, have spent the summer helping us to fix it up. And, and so I've been thinking a lot this summer about the idea of community and what it means is I've been watching people like Johnny McAdam you know, paint my walls and, uh, you know, chip away, you know, the old fireplace and stuff like that. I've been thinking about it. It's been quite a kind of symbolic thing to watch 
my friends help me to create my home for my family. It's quite a kind of an amazing thing, really. Um, and I've been thinking a lot about what that means and, and what it means for all of us. And um, I was chatting to, to my small group about this uh, last week and asking them just to share a few testimonies about actually what does this community, this little group that we have uh, mean to you? What's it done for you? Um, most of a, a fair number of us have been around, have been involved in it for, for the, from when it started, when Lizzie and I took it over. Um, and it's been really a joy this week to read through a few of these things. And I wanted to just share a few of these with you because what I want to do is just kind of raise a, a vision, really, for living life in community with other people. Now, I know that lots of us do that already, and lots of us have a high, high value for it, but I'm talking about intentional, and I think there is something very precious about in homes community where you actually spend time in each other's lives and you, you see how people are with their kids and you see how they are when, you know, everything hits the fan and they're running out of money that month. You know, that kind of community that you only... Well, it's just much easier to get to that place, I think, when you're actually in the four walls of someone's house. And I want to just lift that up because I think... For us to get to where we need to go as a church and where God is taking us, we need to, we're we're not going to do that alone. We're going to do that together in community. And uh, and that's what I wanted to share about this this morning. So I just want somebody, one of our, I'm I'm not going to give you names except for one person who's going to come out and and share from the front. but I just wanted to, somebody, somebody in my small group just handed me this during worship and said, if you want to share this, you can. This is what she's written. The thing about small group is, the commitment to, is that the commitment to each other extends well beyond Wednesday nights. It's people who share life, to share life with, whether I've been struggling or celebrating. I have felt like I have people behind me, supporting me, encouraging me and inspiring me. Come on. What an amazing testimony. Um, Another one, another one I got, um, so I will ask you to open your Bibles at some point this morning, but I just want to share these. I want to make sure that I share these because this is the main point, I think, of this morning, really. Um, What about this one that I got sent in an email? I hope it has been really refreshing to join a small group with a welcoming atmosphere and a strong sense of family and stability. The last 18 months or so have been a journey of building friendships, being encouraged and encouraging others, and sharing the highs and lows of my own life, as well as the successes and disappointments of other people's lives. My time in small group has been hugely restorative and has given me an opportunity to truly connect with people. I'm looking forward to the months and years ahead as the connections grow stronger and deeper. Amazing. But with this one, thank you for allowing me to take a risk and to trust and for also answering uh, answering questions and listening. Thank you for not needing me to explain how I feel or what is going on in my head. I could keep going on, he says in this email, but I'll cry. The fact that you have welcomed me in, included me, valued me, really messes with my head. And although scary, it is part of what I need. I know we all have stories, but even in the midst of my recent difficulties, it is good to know that I have people who care. I need your big prayers and faith. Thank you again and again. Wow. And what are we, what are we, what are we doing? What we do, I'll tell you what we're doing. I'll give you an insight into my small group. This is what we tend to do. We tend to eat dinner, and then we tend to chat, and if somebody remembers, we will do something spiritual. <laughs> and often no one does. 
And yet these are the stories that come out of just that. What about this one? I first came to Hope about a year ago now. I had been brought up in church and had not been for decades. And turning up that day on my own was a big deal for me. One of the first person, sorry, one of the first people I met when I arrived made me feel so welcome and encouraged me to sit with them for the service. The worship blew me away. I cried throughout because I realized I was home. I realized I had found a house of God that I connected with. After the service, Lizzie insisted that I come along to something called small group. Being invited into the Ford's home was a wonderful moment for me as I felt I suddenly belonged. I had been living in Glasgow for about a year and a half at that stage and I had been desperately searching for some sense of community. I found this at Hope, but more specifically in small group. Almost immediately, I felt part of the group. Every single person within the group made me feel welcome and most importantly, it made me feel valued and loved. Sitting down with new friends and enjoying some food really helps build strong relationships. These connections then spread out across the church, allowing you to meet even more new friends. Through Hope and their small groups, I feel I have a new family here in Glasgow. I know I always have someone out there who's looking out for me. Wow. Wow. And I have, people, I have people to look out for too. Every week, my Wednesday nights are filled with laughter, stories, prayer, and great food. Which one of me or Lizzie do you think is responsible for the last one? We're encouraged to take risks, tell stories, and share with each other. Small group for me is a very nurturing and really encourages me to step out with God. I can say hand in heart, I have found the community I was looking for. Isn't that amazing? Wow! That's amazing. That is amazing. And I've got one more. And this one's live, which is even more exciting. Terry, the wonderful Terry and Neil, who are real mums and dads in our group. I asked Terry... I asked Terry if she would just come and share a wee bit about what small group means to them. So, you know, in our small group, Neil and I are by far the older couple in the group. But, you know, we could be, we're pretty much the age of of their parents. And the most precious thing is that although they respect and honor us as being, you know, older, and they look to us sometimes for advice, the most precious thing is they treat us like we're friends, And so it doesn't feel like, you know, they're patronizing us. It's like we're just part of this very special thing, and I think that's wonderful. But I I think the thing that really struck me when I was thinking what what stands out, and I hope I can do this without crying, is that um, sometime last year, Neil and I went through a really, really rough time financially, and we hadn't really said anything to anybody, but we came to home cell, you know, we kind of share what's going on in your lives, and we sort of said, well, you know, it's... We don't think we'll get through the week, never mind the month. <laughs> so they just immediately stood up. And the prayers and the prophetic words carried us through the next week and the months after that. I, I can't even describe. It was like we heard, you know, somebody's got your back. And the love and the devotion. And also people put their hands in their pockets. You know, these are young families who don't have a lot of money. And we weren't talking about five pounds. We were talking about hundreds of pounds they gave us which physically actually got us through the time period. So, you know, that's what it's about. It's a real commitment, not just to pray, but also to, to be there um, in a physical and a, in a real way. So I want to say thank you, Phil. Come on. What about that? Wow. Come on. What about that? Amazing. Um, Arthur Miller, the playwright, said this, that all drama comes out of characters attempting to make home in a hostile world. This is because this is what everybody wants. This is hardwired into our DNA because this is where we all started. 
We all started in a garden as part of a family. And we're all looking for that place where we can be authentically, truly, vulnerably ourselves. We can be intimate with each other without shame. Where we can just stand before our friends and family as we are and know that we will be loved and supported and cared for and encouraged. And that is what community is all about. And there's so many exciting things going on in Hope Church right now. And they're all amazing, and I love them all. And it's not about lifting up one rather than another. It's lifting, about lifting up everything together. And I want to say that com- but community, intimate, heart-to-heart relationships that will sustain you now and for the rest of your life is a huge part of what we are about. This is the kind of container into which God can pour his spirit and his blessing. This is the container into which, out of which everything else that we want to do will flow. You know, I and, and many others are in this for the long haul, okay? Not, not a kind of a, a, a light that burns brightly for about five minutes, and then the agenda moves on, but actually a community of people who actually, you know, who live lives together, who watch their kids grow up together, you know, who, you know, I'm looking at these kids who play around here this, in, in the mornings and thinking about the youth group that they're going to have when they're all teenagers. Why? Because actually I'm committed to this family. And I think that this is the way that God wants to work eh, among us. Family, home, mums and dads. Uh, Can you turn, please, to uh, Genesis chapter 4? I just want to say a very few little things. Um, And hopefully this will come out okay. Um... But yeah, we all came from that place of family, um, that Eden, where we got to be, where, um, before the fall, where Adam and Eve were just, you know, totally as they were before their Father in heaven, and totally without shame. And that's where we all want to get back to. Um, but chapter 4, and you might think, well, why are you reading chapter 4? Because that's a really depressing chapter. And it is, and I've read it a lot, and the more I read it, the more depressing it gets. Um, but, <laughs> but I'm reading this story of, I want to read the story of, of Cain and Abel. Uh, it's a kind of a negative example in some respects. Um, but as I was reading it, even though it's, it's, it's a depressing story, it's also to me an exciting story because... In Hebrews chapter 12, we read this. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to, the, to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn. This is us, by the way. The assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. This is a depressing story, but the exciting thing is this, that every point of failure in this story is intended to be reversed in Jesus. Every single one. So we're going to look at some things and we're going to think, wow, that was a mistake. But the exciting thing is this, that we, in our lives, can reverse all these mistakes. You see, it's extraordinary to me that in Genesis, in the first couple of chapters of Genesis, you've got this extraordinary community, this amazing family in Eden. And by the end of the fourth chapter, you've got one bloke Cain, 
alone and scared and wandering the earth, looking for a place to stay. And you think, wow, how has that happened? So quickly, so quickly it unravels. But the exciting thing is, to me, I read this story and I think, wow, I know people who are alone and scared and wandering the earth and looking for a home. And we can provide one. Because Jesus' blood speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. You see, Abel's blood was shed and it spoke judgment. It spoke for judgment on Cain and actually judgment for the human race. But Jesus' blood speaks mercy for all the Cains who are out there wandering and for all, all the world. Okay, so... This story then, um, let's, just, let's just read it to verse 16 and then I'll just say a few words about it um, as quickly as I can. Okay, now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. And now Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain was a worker of the ground. And in the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your face fallen? And if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not well do well, sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to, his, to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field. And Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. And the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield you its strength. to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground and from the fa- your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth and whoever finds me will kill me. And then the Lord said to him, not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. Then Cain went east away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you, Lord, that your blood speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. God, it speaks of mercy and actually the family of heaven being expressed on earth, on unity among people, on genuine love from a pure heart. And Father, I pray that you would help us, Lord, to really grasp what it is to be this assembly of the firstborn from the dead and to really grasp what it is to be brothers and sisters and mums and dads together, to be committed to each other in love. Uh, God, help us to grasp something of the wonder of being caught up in your family. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, now the thing about this story is it begins actually reasonably well, particularly when you consider how bad chapter three of this, of this book is. So chapter three is the fall, Adam and Eve, um, you know, being sent from the Garden of Eden, and you think, wow, that's, that's not a place, a good place to begin. And yet we find in verse 1, now Adam and Eve knew his wife, sorry, Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. I've got a man with the help of the Lord. Now, here's the amazing thing. 
is that actually, in the previous chapter, the first gospel preach is done by God himself. And as you would expect, because it's God who's preaching, he gets a 100% response. <laughs> There's only two of them, and they both put up their hand, yes, I'll respond to that. And the, the reason we know that is because Adam calls his wife. Now think about this, Adam has just been, the curse is, you know, from dust you, re- you came from, and to dust you will return. It's a death sentence. And Adam's response to God preaching the gospel to him is that he names his wife Eve, which means the mother of the living, which is an extraordinary act of faith because he knew that they had sinned and he knew that they were going to die. But he had faith enough in God that God could raise them from the dead, that there there will come a time There will be a moment when God's provision for them will be such that he will break the bonds of death because Eve is the mother of the living. Isn't that awesome? Wow. That's that's a lot of faith. That's a lot of faith. And Eve, we know she gets saved because she says this when she conceives Cain and, and bears Cain. She says this, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. What this tells us is this, that actually life, life comes from intimacy, intimate relationships where you trust in God. That is where life, life flows from that place. Okay, now obviously there's a very particular kind of intimacy within a marriage. Don't get the wrong idea. But we can, you can take that and extrapolate out to all relationships. Intimacy, where you are completely yourself, where you are completely exposed and risking, this is who I am, this is my heart, this is who I am on the inside. That intimate relationship, anchored in a trust of God, in God, is where life flows. That is where things are born. People, churches, ministries, that's where people are saved out of that that kind of context, that kind of relationship. That is how life flows. I love, but incidentally, I love that Eve um, Eve says, you know, uh, I've done this with the help of the Lord. And it kind of shows that kind of childlike dependence that she had and that provision on the provision and the goodness of God. You know, so often we display our hearts or what our understanding of who God is when good things happen to us. Lots, lots, lots of times people think, well, you really know where you are and what you believe when, you know, you're really in the soup and things are going badly. And that is true. But I tell you what else shows you what you think about God. When things go really, really well. When you are unbelievably blessed. You know, who do you thank? How do you, to what degree do you celebrate? It's a really interesting question. You know, kind of, ah, well, you know, it was, it was nothing, you know. But actually, Eve, with the help of the Lord... It's not just us. It's not just, I mean, we did something. We played our part. But it's not just us. Actually, God did something here. Why? Because it shows you that she's come to a place of faith and trust in God's goodness. Um, But yeah, the main thing there is that out of this place of intimacy and trust in God, life flows. Uh, now, if we, if we go on in the story and we look at uh, verses 3 uh, to 5, it says this, In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the, gr- the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat por- portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his
his offering, he had no regard. Okay, the clear indication here is that Cain's offering was not perhaps the best that he had. We know that because it's compared to Abel's offering, and it says specifically that it's the firstborn of his flock that he offers, and it's the fat portions. You have to remember that this is a time where um, people didn't eat meat. Everyone was a veggie, like Alison, Alan Harrison, just looking at him over there. Um, another veggie. Uh, so so to, keep, to keep flocks of sheep at a time when everyone's a veggie, you know, it's, 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 you know, you're keeping it for wool, you're keeping it for, you know, to make nice items. Um, you know, there's a certain kind of flamboyance, I suppose, uh, to that. Uh, but, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Cain was a farmer. He, you know, he was sweating out in the fields every day, desperately trying to raise some, something for himself. And it's interesting that he just brings what he has. He doesn't bring the best into his, to his relationship with God, to his sacrifice with God. And what that does really is it shows us that Cain is, rather than offering to God out of a place of trust and love, is actually primarily motivated by fear and distance. This, in many senses, is the beginning of religion. This is form without heart. This is a dead ritual that speaks of fear and separation from God rather than intimacy and love and trust. Cain didn't give the best because he'd worked for it. He had worked hard for it. And he he knew what it cost him. You see, the land was already cursed in the previous chapter and he had worked hard and he had sweated for that food, for that grain. And he, to give it up to God is actually a flamboyant expression of trust. That he is good and he is, just as Eve said as mum, that actually I did this with the help of the Lord. I did this out of a place of trust. And I did this because God was working in me. God was providing for me. He is my ultimate provider. But Cain couldn't bring himself to do that. And so it spoke of actually his fear of God, the fact that he, that he wasn't sure that God would provide for him. He wasn't sure that God was a loving father. He wasn't sure that God was good. You wonder why he offered anything. Well, just like all religious practice, there's a desire to be righteous, but to appear righteous by your own works, by your own strength, by your own desire, rather than out of a place of trust and connection with God. That kind of self-righteousness is a destroyer of intimacy in all forms. It's a destroyer of intimacy with God, and it's also a terribly, terribly destructive thing in relationship with other people. The desire to look good, the desire to have it all together, the desire to seem like things are going well. And what we can actually do is we can hold people at arm's length because we don't want them to really know the truth. And I look back on my own life and I think, really, I only started getting this when I married my wife, who gets this much better than I do. I think that I was actually probably much more comfortable at holding people at arm's length because I really, the root of it, which isn't pleasant, was this, that I wanted to seem better than I was. 
and, and the, the, I knew that the, tr- the closer you got to me, the more you'd see the flaws. The more you'd see... Somebody was nodding a bit too vigorously there. Uh, <laughs> the more, but the more you'd realize that this guy, this guy really, doesn't have, really doesn't have it all together. And, and, and it, it just seemed easier to me for many years of my life to hold people just at a distance. You know, just so they got what I presented them with. It's a killer of intimacy. That self-righteousness. That self-righteousness. That lack of trust. That hard-heartedness. And you can see that actually in, in Cain's reaction, when God, um, God says, well, you know, you're offering... It's, it's not great. You know, I mean, he's honest with them. You know, Cain, it says in verse 5, Cain was very angry and his face fell. Angry with God and hiding from God in shame. It's that mixture of anger and shame that's at work. You see, this is the same reaction and actually a very similar story to the one Jesus tells about the prodigal son and the older son. You know, about the one who's been out in the, the older son who's been out in the field working all day and the younger son who, you know, has the big party thrown for him. And just like the older son, he's alone. It's one of the most striking elements of that story. That there's a party going on in the house, a community of people having a few beers together. And enjoying life. And he is standing outside absolutely alone. I will not go in. I am angry. I am angry at this. And it's the same with Cain. He is angry and he is ashamed. He's ashamed. He's embarrassed. Because he is wanting still, like the older son and the prodigal, to be his own saviour. It's amazing. I once taught this story to a bunch of kids, and kids are far more honest by rule than adults are. Um, and I, I, I got to this point in the story where, where God um, seems to accept Abel's sacrifice and not Cain's sacrifice. And I said to them all, now how do you think, if you were Cain, how do you think he would feel in that situation where somebody gets praised and you don't. How, how does that make you feel? And, and I kind of was expecting them to say, angry, like, like Cain. But actually, one little boy said something which has really stayed with me, because I think it's really behind the anger. He said this, when that happens, I feel alone. I feel unnoticed I feel like alone yeah like I'm alone and you think wow maybe that's what Cain felt maybe that's the key to the story really we start off feeling alone so we keep something back because we don't feel we can trust God or other people with it fully And that only just makes us end up feeling more alone. Verses 8 and 9 are really interesting. Cain spoke to his Abel, his brother, when they were in the field. And Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. And then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? And he said, I don't know. (laughs) Do you know what I mean? I mean, in 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 much less serious circumstances, parents have that conversation with their kids all the time, (laughs) don't they? What what happened to the six yogurts in the fridge? Don't know. No idea. You know, the yogurt dribbling down their chin. No idea. Haven't seen them. (laughs) 
Where's your brother? I don't know. Then he says this. It's almost like a little afterthought. It's almost like, you know, God's walking away and he just can't help himself. Am I my brother's keeper? Am I my brother's keeper? It's interesting that that word keeper in that verse is the same word that is used in God's commission to Cain's mum and dad. It says this in, in Genesis, the Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. And that word keep is the same word that Cain says when he says, I'm my brother's keeper. I think what it says is this, that actually God is expecting us to cultivate our relationships with one another in the way that we were intended to cultivate the Eden that he gave us. We're supposed to bring out the glory and the good that God has deposited in each one of us, just as Adam and Eve were asked to do that with the garden. Cultivate this garden. Keep it. You know? Pull out the weeds. Encourage the stuff that's good. Make it beautiful. Cain says, am I my brother's keeper? The implication is that God is expecting us to be exactly that. And to see it as a commission to see it as a responsibility, even a covenant, that actually we would, we would commit ourselves. You know, in the way that a gardener, you know, is committed to doing things year in, year out, taking the time to make sure this thing produces life, that we would be committed to our relationships and that. Do you know in our small group, after four years, I don't really have any secrets about how to run one except this, that we do it every week. And we do it every week. And we do it every week. Maybe that we eat together, but we do that every week too. See, I'm serious. It's about showing up. Fundamentally, that's what relationships are like. It's about, you know, marriage. You know, who's married here? You know, listen, you know what what I'm talking about. Sometimes it's just about showing up. (laughs) Isn't it? Let's be honest. You know, every day is not a bowl of cherries. And some days you just think, I'm here. And that's about all. But I'm still here. And I'm not leaving. It's just about saying, I'm committed to you. You know, in our um, leadership team, um, which began life um, a few years ago with Nick, Andy, and myself, we had a couple of stormy, stormy years where Nick Trego just consistently acted as the life raft <laughs> for two very scary men who were also scared of each other. And, and not all of these meetings yet yeah, were particularly pleasant, but there just came this stubbornness. <laughs> I mean... It wasn't always pleasant that I'm not leaving, you know, and you can't make me. <laughs> I'm going to keep showing up. So, so you're going <laughs> to, you're going to have to learn to deal with it. You know what I mean? You're going to be looking at this phrase for a long time, buddy. So you better get used to it. It's the commitment to show up and to keep, just keep the rhythm of it in life, you know. Things happen in life, you know. Tough stuff happens. 
you feel that the last thing you want to do is have people in your home. And then they come, they stay around for a couple of hours and they leave and you think, thank God they came tonight because they saved us. You know, there will always be a time you think, oh, I'm too tired. I can't be bothered. This is too much effort. Listen, what Cain discovers is it's way more effort being on your own. Way, 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 way more effort. You just got to keep showing up. You just got to say, we're going to do this. I'm going to keep doing it. And out of that comes trust. And out of trust comes intimacy. And then God can really get moving in people's lives. Very quickly. Um, yeah. Verses tw- verse 12. Um we read this, when you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. This is what happens to religiousness. This is what happens for isol- in isolation. The thing that we think will save us actually becomes a curse. So, you know, he thought he would be saved by his efforts working the land. God reminds him, actually, that thing that you think is going to save you is actually a curse to you. And that's true for for all kind of idolatry, isn't it? You know, when we think our, our great career will save us, we end up 65 and just full of regrets. Why did I give so so much of my life to that? And why did I miss out on so much? Because idols promise a lot and they deliver nothing. You know, in the end, you have to carry them. Whereas God carries you. So, we end up in this place where the thing that we think will save us is the thing that it is a, is a curse. But Jesus' blood speaks a better word. And there is an opportunity, I think, in this season for us to really get something into the DNA. I think, if I'm honest with you, more profoundly than it is currently. That we are committed to one another, to family relationships, to meeting in homes, to doing life together. I know that we, I know that some of us do it, and and in some senses I'm preaching to the converted, but for others we need to hear this. We need to make this a priority because this, this is what life is about. And this is how God is going to change you. And he's going to use you as part of a community of believers. You know, I was a guy who used to be involved in church leadership who actually had no friends. (laughs) I'm serious. I had no real friends. I had people that I related to in discipleship coffees. Do you know that horrible thing? Have you, ever been to, have you ever been for one of them in a church context? Somebody's going to take me for coffee. Do you know what I mean? How weird is that? It's not, it's not peer-to-peer. It's not eye-to-eye. It's not heart-to-heart. It's, you know, great. I'm glad you showed up because I've got 20 minutes to impart my wisdom and then I've got to go. It's not intimacy. It's not real relationship. And do you know the funny thing is, the one getting discipled is lonely, but the guy doing the discipling is also lonely. And there's been far, far too much of this in Christianity. And what we need is authentic, real heart-to-heart relationships where we meet together in our lives, in our homes, as part of family, where we get the the diversity and the spread of the generations, where we show the world that actually 
you know, people who don't seem like they have much in common can be so committed and so loving to one another that there must be something about God in this. I can't tell you the number of people who are not in this church and who are not believers who have come up to me and Leslie over the last few months and said, I cannot believe the amount of help you have had in your house. My own family are like, wow, I've never seen anything like this. People just keep showing up with meals and a hammer. (laughs) It's incredible. So from the bottom of my heart and Lizzie's heart, and on behalf of Maisie, I want to say thank you for all the people who have been involved in that. Thank you to my small group for giving me hope that I can be a leader and also have friends (laughs) and real friends. And actually, we can move forward into all that God's got for us together. Amen? Amen. Amen. Come on.